In the early years of the U.S. military's involvement in Vietnam, before American troops were fully committed to the fight against the falling dominoes of communism in Southeast Asia, the Army's top brass were haunted by what had happened to the last great colonial power there. Long before they were overwhelmed and forced to surrender at Dien Bien Phu, the French Army had been outmaneuvered and outfought by General Vo Nguyen Diap's Viet Minh. Hiding in the jungles and staying on the move, the Viet Minh harassed and decimated the larger, slower, less mobile French forces. They had had an almost supernatural ability to appear out of nowhere, strike quickly and hard, and disappear into the countryside again. The American war planners knew that, like the French, they would find their superior technology and strength reduced, if not canceled out altogether, by the thick jungle, through which led only a few narrow, twisting roads. Guerrilla conflict was virtually unknown to the U.S. Army's regular infantry units. The last time Americans were involved in guerrilla warfare was in the Philippines at the turn of the century. The regulars arrived in country in parade uniforms and footgear, with bright white name tapes and multicolor patches. Their weapon, the bulky M14, perfect for Europe's planes, was unsuitable for the jungle. Air mobility was still being perfected, and so the young grunts set forth in this strange new land as soldiers had for a generation, on foot. One thing was clear. If American forces were to have any chance of winning this war, they would need eyes and ears that could penetrate the jungle canopy and guide the overwhelming U.S. firepower to the lurking enemy. In 1949, the United States and Soviet Union had begun their game of Cold War brinkmanship. With the threat of communist expansion in Europe, the United States and 11 other Western nations formed the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The Soviet Union and its affiliated communist nations in Eastern Europe responded by forming the rival Warsaw Pact in 1955. The alignment of nearly every European nation into one of the two opposing camps formalized the political division of the European continent that had taken place since World War II. This alignment provided the framework for the military standoff that continued throughout the nearly five decades of the Cold War. In terms of sheer numbers of forces in Europe, the West was outgunned. The Soviet numerical superiority was roughly four to one in men and two to one in tanks. If war erupted, Germany would surely have been overrun, and no one wanted to resort to weapons of mass destruction to restore the balance of power on the battlefield. NATO commanders began to look at ways to buy time to bring additional forces to bear and halt the Russian steamroller. Unless they were slowed down, the Soviets would take all of Europe in an estimated six weeks. To buy this valuable time, NATO needed a force that could gather intelligence, organize resistance behind enemy lines, and harass advancing ground troops. The answer was the U.S. Army's long-range recon patrols. But by the early 60s, the United States military and foreign policy focus was no longer primarily a conflict in Europe. The Vietnam War at the time was the longest war the United States military had ever been involved in. It started uh, slow and small with special operators, special forces, secret organizations. But beginning by 1963 and 1964, larger numbers of United States Army Special Forces began to arrive. Groups of advisors were then assigned to the Army of South Vietnam, the ARVN, or Army of the Republic of Vietnam. They began to advise many of these organizations 
as they went out on sweeps against uh, combat units of the communists in Viet Cong. These became larger and larger. Swift and sure has been U.S. retaliation for communist PT boat attacks on the high seas. This is the Maddox, one of the two destroyers that were attacked while patrolling international waters in the Gulf of Tonkin near North Vietnam. Warplanes from two carriers, the Ticonderoga and the Constellation, avenged the unwarranted red assault with 64 sorties to North Vietnam PT bases. 25 boats, more than half the fleet, were destroyed. By 1965, largely because of political unrest within South Vietnam, the United States military was sent in division and brigade strength for the first time into Vietnam. In addition to the Special Forces, the United States Army sent combat troops, the 173rd Burburn Brigade, the 1st Air Cavalry Division, and many others beginning in 1965. The United States Marine Corps uh, conducted landings along the coast and began sending troops into Vietnam. As the U.S. increased its commitment to the war in Vietnam, it began to deploy large numbers of combat troops. These troops soon found that they had entered combat with inadequate reconnaissance resources. Soon, unit commanders began forming provisional reconnaissance units. There were only a handful of LERPs, or Ranger units, on the Army rolls at the beginning of the war. But as in every other instance in American military history, it did not take long before actual combat showed the big brass the need for more of the small, mobile recon units. Eventually, commanders were granted the authority to form permanent LERP units. Divisions were authorized LERP companies and separate brigades LERP detachments. You want to know what we're looking for in the LERPs? We want a special kind of person. Someone with an average of 13 and a half years education, 20 to 21 years old, even tempered, likes the outdoors, is willing to undergo selective intensive training, and can work in small groups. And one last thing, preferably an orphan. Personnel were initially drawn from the divisional or brigade cavalry scout or anti-tank units. Many of the personnel selected were graduates of the Ranger School or the Jungle Warfare School in Panama, but most received their training on the job or from the MACV Recondo School. November 75th was, like I say, the long range patrol unit for the 173rd Airborne Brigade. Uh, initially, when the 173rd or all combat units got into Vietnam, this was 1965 when combat units began to arrive. Uh, it was found that there was, uh, they needed a reconnaissance capability. There wasn't one organized into their tables of organization and equipment. Combat units weren't organized to conduct that, those types of missions outside of local squad patrolling. And because of the, the terrain, the jungle, the triple canopy floor, their reconnaissance wasn't that effective because they couldn't see through the trees. So units had to begin organizing a reconnaissance unit from out of hide. And in 65, uh, what was called long range reconnaissance patrol platoons were organized out of hide by uh, division and uh, brigade headquarters to operate, you know, it, to provide intelligence for the commanders. Uh, these platoons initially, like I say, were organized out of hide from volunteers, and it was, this was before my time, but, but these are the guys that, that blazed the way for us. They developed all the tactics, techniques, and procedures that I would be taught at that one week uh, training course uh, when I got into N-75. They devised all that stuff. Rapidly expanding operations caused some LERP units to field members who had not attended school, however. And in some cases, teams were sent to the field with one or two members who were cherries, fresh in country, and had never patrolled in the jungle before. Originally, it wasn't just uh, infantry 11 Bravos that were assigned to the units. They would take everybody they could get, truck drivers, clerks, whoever wanted to volunteer. But once volunteered, uh, they attended the uh, uh, 
Wakanda, Wakanda's commando school run by 5th Special Forces Group right there in the country. And at that school is where they learned how to conduct The MACV Recondo, Reconnaissance Commando School, was formed at the request of General William Westmoreland, the commander of U.S. troops in Vietnam. The school was staffed by members of the 5th Special Forces Group, or 5th SFG. During the course of instruction at Nha Trang, students were taught various reconnaissance and patrolling techniques. Many of the instructors had also attended the British Jungle Warfare School in Malaysia. Students included troops from the United States Marine Corps, U.S. Army, Royal Thai Marine Corps, Royal Thai Army Special Forces, Republic of Korea Recon Marines, and Vietnamese Special Forces and Rangers. As a final graduation exercise, students were required to conduct an actual combat patrol under the supervision of instructors. LERPs usually operated in four to eight man patrols. The LERP units provided ground force commanders with intelligence on the tactical situation in their areas of responsibility, AOR. LERPs units were also tasked with a number of direct action, DA missions. Units attacked Viet Cong, VC supply areas, tracked enemy units, directed airstrikes, and harassed the VC. A LERP stands for Long Range Recon Patrol, or LRRP. And, uh, the Army lexicon, of course, having lots of initials and acronyms, uh, we used to just call them LERPs. They had good field rations that you could just mix water with, and they were favored among the troops in Vietnam. Their mission was a very hazardous one. They would go out in small groups of five to ten, sometimes larger, but usually smaller, looking for concentrations of the enemy, whether it's headquarters or supply bases or enemy movements. Uh, and this includes going out and looking on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They're very highly trained, very skilled. Uh, they're almost like special forces. In fact, many are special forces qualified. Uh, and their job was to find and report enemy positions, movement, headquarters, supply buildups, uh, largely an intelligence role and highly dangerous. Normally they would carry AK-47s, uh, enemy weapons, uh, to confuse the enemy on s signal fires, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, I went because I had uh, a special camera with a telephoto lens, and they wanted somebody uh, who could go along and use this type of camera so we didn't have to get in real close. And the greatest picture I ever took in Vietnam was a line of 300 North Vietnamese Army regulars with pith helmets, regimental unit identification numbers coming up the side of a hill and they came within five yards of where I was hiding. And I took the picture, several pictures in fact. And of course the uh, S2 immediately, the intelligence uh, back at Brigade immediately confiscated all these pictures and classified them because we had found the regimental headquarters of the 22nd Regiment that our brigade had been looking for for almost three months. And we landed almost in the middle of them. And we played a game of hat and cat and mouse or hide and seek with these guys. And the LERPs were the ones who were the masters at this. Masters of disguise, masters of being able to move at night, uh, masters of being able to hide during the day. LERPs, again, it's a, it's a ranger concept. Special forces use it as well. They use it particularly in their, in their the Greek Sigma and Omega organizations when they were doing, and, and, and SOG as well. It's just any special unit, small unit that goes into, goes far away from the parent unit. Rangers do it in particular, going far away from the conventional unit that they're operating with, sometimes beyond the artillery fan, sometimes not. Um, but they just going out, way out in enemy territory, looking for, usually for multiple days, looking for intelligence. Generally, they, their rules of engagement are not to fire, Let's fire it upon, keep yourself very, very quiet, just look, sometimes look and call in airstrikes, but stay on scene. That's basically what the MERP is. Operating for a week at a time in six-man hunter-killer teams, often out of the range of any friendly support, they were the eyes and ears of the infantry units they supported. The effectiveness of these teams in Vietnam was undermined not by a lack of skill or courage, but by local conditions 
uncertain military objectives, the highly politicized nature of the war, and the inventiveness of their enemy. The subtropical climate, terrain, and fauna all exacted a toll on American troops. <laughs> 